This program is paid for by Your Radio Doctor, LLC. All opinions or statements expressed on this program are solely those of Your Radio Doctor and their guests and do not reflect the opinions of WPHT or Odyssey. Your Radio Doctor does not recommend or endorse any specific tests, products, physicians, procedures, opinions, or other information that may be mentioned on Your Radio Doctor. Always consult your own physician. Today's program has been pre-recorded. I'm Lisa Thomas-Laurie. If you're on Medicare, I've got great news. Keystone 65 HMO plans from Independence Blue Cross have earned five stars. Medicare's highest rating for 2022. Some plans have no monthly premiums, no deductibles, and no co-pays for primary care visits and some prescription drugs. Don't wait. Visit ibxmedicare.com slash star. Every year, Medicare evaluates plans based on a five-star rating system. Keystone 65 offers HMO plans with a Medicare contract. Enrollment in Keystone 65 Medicare Advantage plans depends on contract renewal. This is a paid endorsement. Talk Radio 1210. WPHT, WPHT, HD, WOGL, HD3, Philadelphia. From the Cherry Hill Volvo Studios, where relationships matter. It's time for the Delaware Valley's first radio doctor. On call every Saturday afternoon at 5. This is your radio doctor with Dr. Marianne Ritchie. Presented exclusively by Independence Blue Cross. Listen, 7 months or 10 months is an absolutely exceptional, exceptionally short time frame to produce this vaccine. Your health determines your life, your longevity, and your happiness. Let your radio doctor lead the way with your medical education. Your radio doctor, Dr. Marianne Ritchie. Good evening and welcome to your radio doctor. I'm your host, Dr. Marianne Ritchie. Each week we bring you a medical topic that's in the news or seasonal. This week, our focus is on a condition that's important all year around, Alzheimer's disease. Joining us this evening is an international treasure. Dr. Ronald Peterson is an MD, PhD from the Mayo Clinic, where he is the Cora Nakao Professor of Alzheimer's Disease Research, the director of both the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center and the Mayo Clinic Study of Aging. He's had countless leadership roles in national and international societies that study dementia, aging, Alzheimer's disease, He's a distinguished Mayo Clinic investigator, and he's received multiple awards, including the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Alzheimer's Association for his extensive research and writings. And by the way, he's an outstanding speaker. Welcome, Ron. We're truly honored to have you as our guest. Well, thanks so much, Marianne, for for having me. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Well, Alzheimer's disease is a term that seems to be used a lot, but in In the bigger picture, it's a form of dementia. And so maybe if you don't mind, we could begin by defining that bigger category, dementia, and then focus on the definition of Alzheimer's. Absolutely. I I think we in the field sometimes confuse our patients with the terminology that we use, and sometimes we use it inconsistently. So it's largely our fault. But you're quite right. Dementia is the big picture. So dementia means... I'm not thinking as well as I formerly did. I'm not remembering as well, and it's affecting my daily function. So I can no longer do what I used to do because of my thinking abilities, not because of my arthritis, my blood pressure, my diabetes, my thinking abilities. That's dementia. Then we ask the question, what's causing the dementia? What's the problem? And here's where Alzheimer's disease comes into play because Alzheimer's disease is the leading cause of dementia, especially in aging in older people, and it is defined by the pathologic entities in the brain. So the plaques and tangles in the brain, that causes Alzheimer's, that depicts Alzheimer's disease. And again, it's the major cause of dementia, but not the only one. Mm -hmm. Maybe 60 to 80 percent of cases? 60 to 80 percent of cases in aging, meaning in your 70s and 80s, but we're learning and we'll get into this a little bit later, but it's a primary component of dementia, but may not be the only cause of a person's dementia later in life. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned plaques and tangles. From what I understand, there's a buildup of abnormal proteins, amyloid being one, tau the other, that are I think the amyloids in the shape of plaques, and as you mentioned, tangles, that's from tau. And that's the specific finding on a biopsy of the brain, right? Right. Um, But obviously, if you find that at autopsy, it's too late to help the patient. But I guess I have two questions as you um, so eloquently started this. How has the definition changed in recent years? Before it was a 
biopsy pathologic diagnosis. Now it's a clinical diagnosis. Well, I mean, years ago, certainly when I was training, maybe when you were training, Alzheimer's disease was thought to be a clinical pathologic entity. And by that, I mean, it followed the clinical picture of dementia that I previously outlined. And we would make that diagnosis some uh, trepidation. We'd say it's probable Alzheimer's disease. And we would do a bunch of what we call rule out exercises. So we do an imaging study of the brain, CT, MRI scan, make sure there wasn't a brain tumor, Make sure there weren't strokes in critical parts of the brain. Make sure the person didn't have hydrocephalus. We did some blood tests, make sure their thyroid function, their B12 level, et cetera. And if we didn't find any of that rule out stuff, we'd say then it's probable Alzheimer's disease, meaning we couldn't say it was definite Alzheimer's disease in the past until person passed away. Did an autopsy, looked at the microscope, looked at the brain under the microscope, saw these plaques and tangles. Then we would say it's definite Alzheimer's disease. And that really ruled the field for decades from 1984 until after uh, 2000, that we would still use that clinical pathologic definition. But as the field has evolved, we now have developed these biomarkers. And these biomarkers now can tell us what's going on inside the brain. So when you use the word biomarkers for our listeners, that means um, studies such as an MRI, we're going to look at spinal fluid, and you're going to go into detail about that, that um, from what I understand, I've listened to your lectures and we had a great conversation the other day, these changes can be found in a person's brain possibly 10 to 20 years before they have symptoms. Wouldn't it be great if we use the test you're going to tell us about, know in advance, because your big goal is to find treatment once we open the door to knowing who has it, who's who's likely to develop it. So the biomarker tests, what would yeah. you include in those? So, so biomarkers mean measures that we find maybe in the blood, maybe in the cerebrospinal fluid if we do a lumbar puncture, or maybe on imaging tests, again, MRIs, PET scans of the brain that indicate that these proteins, the amyloid that makes up the plaques, the tau that makes up the tangles, actually exist in the brain without doing an autopsy or a biopsy. So biomarkers, biomarkers we're more familiar with the things like elevated cholesterol. Mm -hmm. Elevated cholesterol means we're on the road to develop heart disease. So it's sort of a surrogate marker, if you will, of the underlying pathologic process. Well, the field of Alzheimer's disease has evolved to the point where we now have imaging tests that in fact tell us this person has amyloid in the brain, this person has tau in the brain. We can do PET scans now that will tell us that those two factors do exist in the brain. We can do a lumbar puncture, a spinal tap, and that will tell us that this person has these proteins in the brain on the basis of the spinal fluid markers. We're evolving to the point where we may be on the cusp of blood tests now, plasma markers that actually will indicate that amyloid and tau are present in the brain. So this is really a major step forward for us in making these diagnoses in life that people have these markers that constitute Alzheimer's disease. And you just said it so beautifully. It's during life. It's During bio, life. meaning right. it's, we can take a blood test and say, your cholesterol is up, that bumps your risk for heart disease. So if you collect somebody's spinal fluid and there's an increased level of the amyloid or the plaque causing protein or an increase in tau, TAU, if people want to look these up, that that, that could suggest um, Alzheimer's. And an MRI might show shrinking of certain right. areas of the brain. And then the PET scan, I'm sure a lot of people have had PET scans for different reasons too, right. uh, for cancer diagnoses and such. But in this case, you add a form of glucose. Tell us about that. Are there certain areas of the brain that pick it up and don't, and that that gives you the pattern? Right. So so there, PET scan is, is a technique, a nuclear medicine technique that will detect certain features in the brain and depends on what, you, what radioactive substance, small amount of radioactivity, you inject into the person will give you some information about the brain. So Marianne, you mentioned glucose. So yes, we can put in radioactive glucose into the blood, goes to the brain. And since glucose is the fuel for the brain, it's really telling us what part of the brain is doing what. A normal person will have normal glucose utilization throughout the brain. Somebody with Alzheimer's disease 
may have certain regions of the brain, the temporal lobe, the parietal lobe, the posterior cingulate, the, the precuneous regions of the brain that are characteristic of decreased glucose utilization, meaning those parts of the brain are not working so well. And this is a pattern we see in Alzheimer's disease. Doesn't diagnose it, but it's, cons- diagnose it, but it's consistent with the underlying pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease. So it's like if you do a cardiac cath, and you you suspect there are blockage uh, block vessels and the person's cholesterol's up. You say, okay, well maybe if we lower the cholesterol or get you moving or your weight, it's an indirect but very good metric. And just listening to you gives people such hope. Um, I mean, I've talked to a few friends this week who said you're talking about Alzheimer's. My relative was just diagnosed with X, Y, or Z. Uh, we can talk about this later. One of the uh, other causes of dementia is amyloid buildup angiopathy, you know, right. there are other right. causes that are not familiar to people. And it's terrifying when people get a diagnosis like that. So I guess the, the key is, you already said, if you have an indication that this or that patient is at risk, and there are biomarkers and MRI, spinal fluid, uh, PET scan, then your super goal is to start them on therapy. Or if you make the diagnosis, how we we'll talk about the therapy yeah, later, but sure. that would be the idea to right. Um, that's move that's with where that. the field is moving. Try to identify the disease process before the symptoms of memory failure begin and intervene at that earlier stage in the disease process. It's just amazing that you've brought the needle forward so exponentially quickly. It's incredible. It's, it's important for break. clinicians. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes, and and this conversation is fascinating. Let's take a little break and we'll be right back with Dr. Ron Peterson from the Mayo Clinic. Thanks for listening to Your Radio Doctor with Dr. Mary Ann Ritchie, exclusively presented by Independence Blue Cross. If you have a question for the medical mailbag, just send a note to doctor at yourradiodoctor.net. Hi, I'm Dr. Denny Carice, Chief Science Officer at Recovery Centers of America, and I'm here as your addiction expert. I've been asked what happens to the brain when people do drugs or alcohol for a long time. We know the most about alcohol, and it can really destroy parts of the brain. You can develop something called Wernicke syndrome, and with that, you have trouble remembering and concentrating and trouble with coordination. The good news about Wernicke's is that it can be absolutely cured, but the bad news is you have to catch it within two or three days of having symptoms. Otherwise, it goes on to develop Korsakoff's, which is also known as wet brain. But the fact that you have to catch it within two or three days is why about 80 to 90 percent of people with Wernicke's do go on to develop Korsakoff's. And Korsakoff's is a tremendously debilitating disease where people have trouble with daily functions, with dressing themselves, with cognitive abilities. It really impairs the person to the point where they need 24-hour care. We know a lot about amphetamines and cocaine as well and what they do in the brain. So one of the problems with them starts with bone density, muscle loss, osteoporosis. Another thing that happens with cocaine and amphetamines is that they can affect the heart. You can have a heart attack or your aorta could blow, which leads you into surgery, which is, of course, not what you planned when you started using drugs, right? It's been shown that people that use a lot of amphetamines, their brain ages twice as fast as the folks who don't use them. Perhaps one of the biggest things with cocaine and amphetamines and methamphetamine is that it really depletes the dopamine in your system. So the dopamine in your system is what enables us all to feel pleasure in everyday activities. What amphetamines and cocaine can do is deplete that dopamine in your body, leading to an inability to find pleasure in everyday life. If you or a loved one has a problem with alcohol or drugs, call 1-888-RECOVERY today or go to recoverycentersofamerica.com. We answer the phone and admit patients 24-7. That number again is 1-888-RECOVERY. 
I'm Lisa Thomas-Laurie. If you're on Medicare, I've got great news. Keystone 65 HMO plans from Independence Blue Cross have earned five stars, Medicare's highest rating for 2022. Some plans have no monthly premiums, no deductibles, and no co-pays for primary care visits and some prescription drugs. Don't wait. Visit ibxmedicare.com slash star. Every year, Medicare evaluates plans based on a five-star rating system. Keystone 65 offers HMO plans with a Medicare contract. Enrollment in Keystone 65 Medicare Advantage plans depends on contract renewal. This is a paid endorsement. Are you in excruciating pain brought on by your son, daughter, or spouse suffering from addiction? You are not alone. If you call Recovery Centers of America today at 1-888-RECOVERY, your whole family can begin to recover. At Recovery Centers of America at Devon and Lighthouse, your loved one will be treated with care by expert addiction professionals, while family programming will give you support and healing so that you can recover as well. RCA accepts insurance, provides transportation, and offers intervention services. Call 1-888-RECOVERY now. When we ask questions, we make sure they're the big ones. Like, how can the healthcare industry earn the trust of patients? And what if your health outcomes and access to care weren't defined by your skin color, sexuality, gender, or zip code? At Genentech, we're removing barriers and partnering across the medical community to make clinical research as diverse as the world we serve to ensure communities have access to health care. Learn how we are working to make health care more equitable at gene.com slash ask bigger questions. And welcome back to your radio doctor, Dr. Ron Peterson from the Mayo Clinic. We're having a fascinating conversation about the progress that you and your colleagues have made in the study of Alzheimer's disease. And we talked, Ron, a little bit about the biomarkers, those studies we could do when the person's still alive, try to find it early, treat, delay, or prevent the uh, onset of symptoms. PET scans, you mentioned one that use radioactive glucose, but there's another more specific um, PET scan, yes, for Alzheimer's? Exactly. So the glucose PET scan tells us what part of the brain is doing what, and it gives us a suggestion of a pattern of hypometabolism, underutilization, that part of the brain. But it's just suggestive. It doesn't give us the definitive diagnosis. But now we also have PET scans where if you give a little radioactive substance that will identify the amyloid protein in the brain, you give another radioactive substance that will identify the tau protein of the brain. Now we can say that these two abnormal proteins are present in the brain, which is tantamount to making the diagnosis of the biological basis of Alzheimer's disease in life. Mm -hmm. And for those just joining us, Dr. Peterson is the keystone. He is the king of research for Alzheimer's uh, disease. And we've talked about a buildup of abnormal proteins called amyloid and tau. So as he refers to them, those proteins have a specific pattern on biopsy. Amyloid looks like plaques and tau looks like tangles. So so we talk about the clinical manifestations or, or what shows up in a person's um memory loss or their behavior. Tell us about that, if you would. Sure. When we when we talk about Alzheimer's disease today, we talk about the clinical spectrum of the disease, the so-called syndrome, as the doctors call it. So you could be cognitively normal. You could be cognitively normal with maybe some subjective feelings that you're not quite remembering as well as you used to. So that's called subjective cognitive decline, but you're still normal. But then as your memory starts to fade a little bit more, you get into the range of what's called mild cognitive impairment. Mild cognitive impairment means that you're probably not remembering as well as you used to, most of us, but maybe you're not remembering as well as you ought to. So now you've Mm. fallen off a bit. So your memory, you and those around you know that you're forgetting things now that you formerly remembered fairly well and things you probably should be remembering. So important dates, appointments with your doctor, the kids are coming over Sunday for dinner and you forget they're coming. Those kinds of important things are now being lost. We think that's probably abnormal and that's mild cognitive impairment. But Everything else is working pretty well. So all your your financial activities, you're still driving, you're paying your bills, you're doing your taxes. To the casual observer, you look pretty normal. But you know you're not quite remembering as well. Your family knows you're not quite remembering as well. And that's kind of that in-between state. You don't meet the criteria for dementia, 
but yet your memory's not quite normal. That's mild cognitive impairment. If that progresses on, though, so now you're not remembering, now you're not calculating as well, you're having a lot of trouble with word finding, things like that, and it's affecting your daily function, now we get into the dementia range. So we go from normal cognition, subjective cognitive decline, mild cognitive impairment, then into dementia. That is sort of the spectrum of clinical progression. And then we ask, as doctors, then we say, okay, what's causing that problem? What's causing that mild cognitive impairment? What's causing that dementia? And here's where Alzheimer's disease comes in as a leading cause of the, uh, the cognitive decline. Mm -hmm. So if somebody starts to become uh, a little confused, and, and I, I had a couple questions as you were speaking. I remember in medical school, we were taught that Alzheimer's, the definition was pre-senile dementia. Those people who become confused or reach the state of dementia long before you'd expect in their 30s or 40s. Under the age of 65 yeah. was okay. pre-senile dementia. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, the other question, if somebody is starting to get a little fuzzy with their memory, um, does it still stand true that it's more likely to show up in more current memory that you remember your own birthday, but but you mentioned certain dates. You meaning in the future, like we were supposed to meet with the kids for dinner next Saturday. Is that what you mean by dates? Yeah. 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 So so the memory failure that is characteristic of early Alzheimer's disease is a failure of what we call recent memory. There you go. So things that you learned yesterday, an hour ago, two hours ago, last week, that recently experienced events may become forgotten. Your old memories, where you went to school, your first girlfriend, boyfriend, all that kind of stuff, that's well preserved late into the disease process. But it's the the medial temporal lobe part of the brain, something called the hippocampus, which is a critical structure that shrinks early in the disease. And the hippocampus is responsible for laying down new memories and recalling recently learned events. That's the kind of memory failure that really affects us early in the Alzheimer's process. And I think that's a great distinction that you carve out so that people are questioning, should I take my spouse or my mother or dad to be checked? Right. That's that's a very, really important distinction. And in terms of remembering old boyfriends and girlfriends, I think the one or two boyfriends I ever had are trying very hard to forget me. But um, <laughs> that's another show. Um, I, I know the feeling. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> we, we, we call our psychiatrist for oh, that. Yes. Yeah. So we talk about other causes of, of dementia, um, but I've heard you say that oftentimes uh, people that have Alzheimer's disease have a combination of uh, right. causes. Let's talk about the other causes, if you like, and um, the more common ones. Sure. So, so when people become more forgetful than they ought to be, say, in that mild cognitive impairment stage, don't automatically assume, oh my gosh, it's Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. It's got to be game over. It could be something that could be treatable. So there are other factors that cause memory impairment, especially in aging. And some of these may be our medical conditions. If we have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, if our diabetes is not in good control or hypertension is not in good control, that could affect our memory. So tuning up our medical issues may very well. And sometimes the medications we use to treat our other medical problems can have side effects. And these side effects can affect our memory. So it may be tuning up our medications, things we're taking, and sometimes over-the-counter uh, products. So Tylenol PM. Well, the PM means Benadryl or mm -hmm. diphenhydramine is the component in Tylenol PM that makes us sleepy and drowsy. Well, those drugs can also affect our memory function. So we have to uh, look at our total medical picture. If we become a bit forgetful, don't always assume it's Alzheimer's disease. There could be other issues. One big issue that's come up more recently, I think, is sleep, sleep hygiene. So Obstructive sleep apnea is very common in aging. The number of people on CPAP and things like that is increasing in our practices all the time. And sleep is an important factor in our daily cognitive function. So if we're not sleeping well at night, say we have undetected or untreated sleep apnea, that can affect 
our daytime wakefulness, our cognition and thinking during the day. If you treat the sleep problem, if you address obstructive sleep apnea, maybe with CPAP or whatever device you want to use, your memory function may come back to normal. I've had patients whom we've identified that is the causative factor of their mild cognitive impairment. You treat the sleep disorder, their memory problem goes away or is greatly diminished. The memory problem is diminished and and they're functioning at a much higher level. So we really need to take a broad picture look at people when they have cognitive issues and don't automatically assume this is onset of Alzheimer's disease. Sure. And I know in our own family, my father um, had bypass surgery at age 66. Back in the day, we used veins and his, his uh, bypass has lasted 10 years, which was glorious. But to go back in the second time with scar tissue, it was a more extensive surgery. And yep. he was on a respirator for several weeks. And when he woke up, he was not the same person. And perhaps congestion or episodes of low oxygen, as you say, if you have a pulmonary condition, if you have low flow to your heart vessels, chances are you have low flow to your brain. But right. so those things have to be maximized. Um, how about former severe head injuries? You, you hear about uh, p- people who are boxers or, or football and that and they repeat many traumas, but that accumulation, does that lead to Alzheimer's it, it, or it, other types of dementia? Probably more of the latter, probably more other causes of cognitive impairment, mild cognitive impairment and dementia. We're less certain that things like head injury actually will cause an increase in amyloid in the brain, increase in tau in the brain, <clears throat> Me, although I must clarify that latter comment, um, we recently did a study on individuals who were in the uh, Vietnam War who had head injuries at that point in time. Many years later, now at the, they're at the age of risk of Alzheimer's disease. We did amyloid scans on them, and there was not evidence of increased amyloid. So it doesn't look like head trauma necessarily increases Alzheimer's disease, but it certainly can increase your predisposition for. Uh, cognitive impairment and maybe dementia. And there is a form of tau that gets deposited in the brain causing CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Mm -hmm. Many of the hockey players, football players have had that. It's not Alzheimer's, but it is a substrate for cognitive impairment. And I think it's uh, important too that people hear what you often say. Dementia is definitely more common as we age uh, and I just remember reading this and uh, about a, a third of people 85 and above have some form of dementia, but it's not a normal part of aging. Would you say that? That's correct. I mm-hmm. mean, yes, cognitive impairment does increase with aging. Degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease increase with aging, uh, but it need not be a natural consequence of aging. You can have preserved cognitive function throughout life as well. Let's take a little break and when we come back maybe we can talk about some of the risk factors and those things that we can work on to prevent uh, cognitive decline. Today's edition of Your Radio Doctor with Dr. Marianne Ritchie, presented exclusively by Independence Blue Cross, can be enjoyed anytime, anywhere, at your convenience. Just download the Odyssey app and search Your Radio Doctor. It's health education on demand. This is Emily Rubin, dietitian at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital and the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics Philadelphia Group, presenting you with the nutrition tip of the week. So when you think of summertime, it usually makes your stomach growl. There are all these barbecues that include grilled meats, sweet corn, juicy watermelon. You stroll down the the boardwalk and there's the smells of the caramel popcorn, pizza, the waves crashing, and each night ending in, in a dripping ice cream cone. Summer is all about carefree time spent with family and friends, but most of these social settings include very indulgent foods. The downside may be some unexpected weight gain. According to a recent study by the Journal of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, children are more likely to actually gain weight during the summer months than even the winter months. So the advice I offer to clients, of course, and patients is to avoid crash diets, especially the beach body goals, and embrace mindful eating to prevent loosening the belt. And again, balance and moderation are key. So here are a few of my tips that we can talk about eating mindfully and healthily from the boardwalk, a place that my family spends on many of the weekends in the summer to the beach, and of course, all those cookouts. So let's first talk about the boardwalk. Talk about all the temptations. Every outlet down the boardwalk has different food samplers 
offering you pieces of fudge, water ice, and gelato, popcorn, and pastries. You know, recently I decided to taste all these treats with my family. To my surprise, it actually helped satisfy my cravings. So how did this actually satisfy my cravings? I made sure I tried all these foods after I ate a balanced meal. This way I wouldn't go to the boardwalk starving. Another tip is maybe eat a little bit less at dinner to plan for those treats. If you want the gelato or the ice cream, order a small or split one with a friend. You will be surprised that the small size is actually much bigger than you really thought. Some other healthy choices are maybe some adding veggies to your pizza like spinach instead of pepperoni or opting for grilled or baked fish instead of fried and really slow down and savor the flavors of your food. So most importantly, don't forget to walk the boardwalk. I bet you can get 10,000 steps in there real quick. This is Emily Rubin presenting you with your nutrition tip of the week. For more information, you can go to yourradiodoctor.com. I'm Lisa Thomas-Laurie. If you're on Medicare, I've got great news. Keystone 65 HMO plans from Independence Blue Cross have earned five stars, Medicare's highest rating for 2022. Some plans have no monthly premiums, no deductibles, and no co-pays for primary care visits and some prescription drugs. Don't wait. Visit ibxmedicare.com slash star. Every year, Medicare evaluates plans based on a five-star rating system. Keystone 65 offers HMO plans with a Medicare contract. Enrollment in Keystone 65 Medicare Advantage plans depends on contract renewal. This is a paid endorsement. When you have orthopedic issues, you need a physician who eats, sleeps, and breathes orthopedics. You need an exceptionally specialized Rothman Orthopedics physician. They not only specialize in orthopedics, each Rothman physician only focuses on one area of the body, which means you can have confidence that you can get past pain and be what you were. Schedule conveniently online at RothmanOrtho.com. That's RothmanOrtho.com. Are you in excruciating pain brought on by your son, daughter, or spouse suffering from addiction? You are not alone. If you call Recovery Centers of America today at 1-888-RECOVERY, your whole family can begin to recover. At Recovery Centers of America at Devon and Lighthouse, your loved one will be treated with care by expert addiction professionals, while family programming will give you support and healing so that you can recover as well. RCA accepts insurance, provides transportation, and offers intervention services. Call 1-888-RECOVERY. Now, when we ask questions, we make sure they're the big ones. Like when it comes to diseases, can we strive to treat, prevent, and even reverse them? And how can we make healthcare more effective and more affordable? These are the types of questions that can help impact the lives of so many patients, that help push the boundaries of innovation and healthcare for all communities. At Genentech, we are the pioneers of the biotech industry, tackling some of the biggest questions in healthcare. Learn more at gene.com slash ask bigger questions. Your radio doctor, Dr. Marianne Ritchie, now Saturday afternoons at 5, presented exclusively by Independence Blue Cross. This program is paid for by Your Radio Doctor, LLC. And we're here with Dr. Ron Peterson from the Mayo Clinic. Ron, we were talking about Alzheimer's disease in specific and dementia in general. We don't clearly understand the risk factors. And as with any disease, the earlier we find it, hopefully the more likely treatment will abate uh, any progression. Um, With uh, causes, we can't pick our genes, we can't pick our relatives, but there are certain things in our lifestyle we can modify. So let's talk about, is there any genetic component or if you have a family member who's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, how does that increase your risk? Well, Alzheimer's disease, like many diseases, Marianne, you know, often runs in families. So we we know that the younger onset of any disease, the more likely there's a genetic contribution to it. In Alzheimer's disease, broadly defined, there's truly genetic Alzheimer's disease, and then there's so-called sporadic Alzheimer's disease. Now, truly genetic Alzheimer's disease is a small proportion, maybe only a 1%, of all Alzheimer's disease is uh, caused by truly deterministic genes. So these are autosomal dominant genes that are in families, rare families, but in those families, roughly 50% of the people throughout the lineage uh, get the disease and they often get it earlier in life, maybe in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, again, 1%, but it's very strongly determined by a few genes that we know about, presenol 1, presenol 2, APP. These are mutations in these families that if the people get the mutation, 
they will get the disease. It's 100% penetrant. They will get it and earlier in life. And it tells us a lot about the underlying biology of the disease. Fortunately, it's only 1%. The other 99% we call so-called sporadic disease is not clearly inherited, inherited in that strong fashion, <clears throat> but it still runs in families. So if you have a first degree relative, mother, father, brother, sister, who has had, again, preferably a, a biologically defined Alzheimer's disease, meaning by autopsy, your risk would be increased maybe three or fourfold over the general population. What's the general population? Again, it's very rough to say, but age 65 and older, maybe 10, 11, 12% of the people will develop Alzheimer's disease. But as we said earlier, it's very age related. So the longer you live, the more likely you are to get it. But if we say 10 to 11, 12% in age 65 and older, your risk would be increased three or fourfold over that if you have a primary uh, relative who who has the disease. But again, you know, the, the the you look at the scale the other way, and it's still much more likely you're not going to get the disease. But it does, and there are what are called susceptibility polymorphisms, which just means that there are genetic features that increase your risk slightly. And there's one called apolipoprotein E. It comes mm -hmm. in three varieties, so-called ApoE two, three, and four. You get one variety from mom and one from dad. So you get combinations of two, 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 three, three, four, 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 all these different combinations. And it turns out that if you inherit the four variety of apolipoprotein E, your risk again is increased maybe three or four fold such that if you get it, uh, uh, your, your, and if you happen to get two copies of it, so you get a four from mom and a four from dad, then your risk might be up as much as 10 to 14 fold over. Again, uncommon, but it does happen. So there are these risk factors that are genetically determined, uh, uh, but, but uh, do not uh, absolutely determine you're going to get the, get the disease. Sure. <clears throat> Fortunately, but, and I think too, um, I remember hearing that um, many people with Down syndrome, uh, which is obviously a genetic condition, develop Alzheimer's as they age and probably a little bit earlier, maybe in their 40s. Yeah. So I guess that suggests that there can be a genetic component. That, that's, a, that's a little bit different because, uh, yes, it is. You're, you're on track, Marianne. Um, so individuals with Down syndrome have what's called trisomy 21. So they have three copies of chromosome 21. And as it turns out, the amyloid protein is coded on chromosome 21. So they wow. overproduce amyloid because they have three copies of the of the chromosome, and so they just generate more amyloid protein. And again, if they live long enough, then they will develop features of cognitive impairment and dementia. Mm -hmm. So as we have these biomarkers become available, it just is so um, fascinating and, and hopeful for people. Um, but we can't screen everybody. It's not like check everybody's blood pressure or even pretty frequent, hopefully everybody over 45 now gets colonoscopy because there are risks to having spinal taps and, and all these things. Right. But um, if uh, I talked to a, an old friend today who said her sister, Harvard law grad, just diagnosed with early Alzheimer's. Right. Uh, I One of our champions, we end every show with a champion, somebody who's faced adversity with courage. Uh, I interviewed a fellow who was writing for the New York Times at age 54 and he noticed changes. He was diagnosed if you have a first degree relative, could you at least start with the genetic testing and see if you have apolipoprotein uh, E or tau or amyloid levels or and then go to biomarkers or? Well, it depends on why you want to do that. I mean, if there, it True. depends on if there's a treatment out there now, and the field is moving rapidly, and we're hoping that we're going to get to disease modifying therapies sooner than later. Then, absolutely, it would be vital to know if you have the tendency to develop the clinical symptoms because you have positive biomarkers, and we can do something about it. Right now, we're not recommending genetic testing in people if they're cognitively unimpaired because what are we going to do about it? Now, there are lifestyle things we should all be doing. So I don't mean to say that there's nothing that can be done, but we do talk and we make recommendations for people as they age, but people as they develop cognitive impairment, 
to remain physically active. Physical exercise is probably the best thing you can do for yourself. And is it going to reduce the likelihood you're going to develop amyloid and tau? We don't know that, but it might have an impact on the likelihood of your developing cognitive impairment. And it may alter the trajectory. I sometimes use the example of if I exercise, watch my diet, don't smoke, am I going to prevent heart disease? Well, maybe not prevent it, but if I'm destined to have a heart attack at 72 and I can push that back to 76 or 78 by my lifestyle, that's a big deal. And I think yes. cognitive impairment and lifestyle modifications are in that same ballpark, that we may be able to alter that trajectory if we're going to develop cognitive impairment. So exercise is one, intellectual activity, staying involved in, in your, your thinking activities, reading, going to plays, discussing things, staying intellectually active. From a dietary perspective, we usually recommend a heart-healthy diet. So what's good for the heart is probably good for the brain. Mediterranean diet, things of that nature are probably beneficial. Staying involved in your social networks, trying to yes. avoid withdrawing as you age, get out there with your friends, your family, doing things is probably stimulating for you. And then we mentioned earlier sleep hygiene. Paying attention to your sleep hygiene, I think, is is probably one of the best things you can do for yourself. So I think these lifestyle factors, again, may not prevent things ultimately, but if they can postpone and slow down that trajectory of impairment, I think that would be uh, important. Yes, because the, there is no data to prove it, but it does seem as though um, there's an inverse association with risk of Alzheimer's if you do follow those measures. and uh, I, th I think so. There's a good deal yeah. of epidemiologic data out there that the suggests, suggests. Mm -hmm. that those factors may, may have an impact. Any uh, gender differences, men or women more or less likely to get Alzheimer's? In general, women have a higher risk, or I should say there are more women with Alzheimer's disease than men. But again, women live longer than yeah. men, so just the age prevalence. But in addition to that, there are some biological features that may predispose women at certain ages also. I mentioned this apolipoprotein E. The way women deal with apolipoprotein E, the impact of apolipoprotein E for carriership in women is different than in men. There may be hormonal differences. There could be lifestyle differences as well. So we're starting to understand the sex differences, but uh, uh, it does appear that women are at somewhat higher risk in addition to their uh, longevity that contributes to this. So I'm fascinated too by the Mayo Clinic study on aging. I, I wish we had another hour, but um, obviously let's talk about the, the goals of research um, are to find treatment, uh, especially if we're able to find changes early and predict in those. What types of therapies are available now? Well, right now there's two classes of therapies. There's the uh, symptomatic drugs that have been out for many years. These are cholinesterase inhibitors, increase the amount of acetylcholine in the brain, another one called an NMD antagonist. These alter neurotransmitters in the brain, keep the nerve cells functioning at a higher level for a period of time, but they don't affect the underlying disease. Disease-modifying therapies, getting at amyloid, getting at tau, are now being developed. And uh, this past year, we've had a very controversial course, but uh, there was one drug that received uh, accelerated approval by the FDA as a disease-modifying therapy. And I think it's opened the door for this class of drugs. Mm -hmm. And I've heard you say, just like cancer, it might take a combination of medications too. Or with right. COVID, do we stop the virus from multiplying or do we block its landing site? Or how do we go about this? So you might, in the end, develop a drug that decreases amyloid levels, a little of that, a little bit that might decrease tau levels, and reduce the inflammation that can come um, from other causes of dementia. So um, tell us just a little bit. We have about a minute left. I want to hear a little bit more about the beauty of uh, Rochester, Minnesota. You have Mayo Clinic and Olmstead County. Right. It's the perfect place to study. 
Yep. Very briefly, uh, Mayo is a, is a large institution in a relatively small town, Rochester, Minnesota, but almost everybody in this area gets their medical care, either from us or the Olmsted Medical Group in our county. And that affords us the opportunity to study the entire community as it ages. So we have the Mayo Clinic Study of Aging, which is a random sample of people aging in place in our community, and we're getting these biomarkers on them, clinical measures, and we're following them longitudinally. And you started out, I had it written out maybe in uh, several years ago, 2014 yep. with ages 70 and over, and then each- 2004 actually mm-hmm. was Four. Uh, 70 to 90-year-olds, then we went down to 50-year-olds, now we're down to 30-year-olds, so we're capturing six decades of aging. And the key feature, again, is randomly sampling people from the community to participate. Random is the important word. Let's take a little break and we'll be back with our wrap-up. Your Radio Doctor with Dr. Marianne Ritchie is presented exclusively by Independence Blue Cross. Hi, I'm Lisa Thomas-Laurie. If you're on Medicare, I've got great news. Keystone 65 HMO plans from Independence Blue Cross have earned five stars. That's Medicare's highest rating for 2022. Some of these Medicare Advantage plans have no monthly premiums, no deductibles, and no co-pays for primary care visits and some prescription drugs. And all plans include dental, vision, and hearing benefits with no co-pays for routine exams. Medicare's highest rating, Philly's most popular plan. Don't wait. Visit ibxmedicare.com star. Every year, Medicare evaluates plans based on a five-star rating system. Keystone 65 offers HMO plans with a Medicare contract. Enrollment in Keystone 65 Medicare Advantage plans depends on contract renewal. This is a paid endorsement. When you have joint pain, you need a physician who eats, sleeps, and breathes joints. Someone so focused on their specialty, they've written the book on it, literally. You need an exceptionally specialized physician from Rothman Orthopedics. They not only specialize in orthopedics, each Rothman physician only focuses on one area of the body, which means you can have confidence that you can get past the pain and be what you were. Schedule conveniently online at RothmanOrtho.com. Official orthopedic partner of the Eagles, Phillies, and Sixers. Now, your weekly prescription brought to you by Genentech, the science-driven company that pioneered the biotech industry to transform how we treat the world's most complex health problems. And now in our last segment called Your Weekly Prescription, sponsored by Genentech. Dr. Ron Peterson, what is your take-home message for our listeners? You know, I, I think the field of Alzheimer's disease and more broadly aging, cognitive impairment, dementia, is moving very rapidly, and we're really coming to understand the bigger picture. And by that, I mean, Marianne, you mentioned earlier in the last segment, uh, there are multiple factors going on. And I think Alzheimer's disease is an important component of cognition and aging, but it's only a component. So most often when we study people and even do autopsies on individuals whom we followed in the Mayo Clinic study of aging, we find they may have amyloid and tau, so they may have an Alzheimer's disease component, but they also are likely to have other neuropathologic features, something called alpha-synuclein, which produces Lewy bodies, which are the culprits in Parkinson's disease, Mm. are commonly seen in aging. There's another protein called TDP43 that deposits in the memory part of the brain and can cause cognitive impairment. Vascular disease, and I don't mean major strokes, I mean little blood vessels that close off here and there around the brain, happens all the time in aging, is very common. And there's another component called CSF dynamics, the way the spinal fluid is circulating in the brain. All of these come into play in any individual as he or she is aging. So the where the field is moving is trying to develop biomarkers for each component, amyloid, tau, alpha-synuclein, TDP, vascular disease, such that I'm thinking down the road, when you go in to see your primary care physician as you're aging, he or she may get a lipid screen on you, what's your LDL, what's your HDL, what's your triglycerides, and get a cognitive screen on you. What's your amyloid, your tau, your TDP, your alpha-synuclein vascular components, and tell you this much is going on, because now 
we can do something about it. So we have a drug for al al uh, amyloid. We have a drug for tau. We have a drug for alpha-synuclein, et cetera, et cetera. And you might end up taking a cocktail or a combination therapy yes. to treat these mm -hmm. various components. I, I think that's a more realistic look at, at what we're dealing with. Alzheimer's disease is very important, but just a component of the total picture. Sure. That makes perfect sense. And I know um, it was important that you reminded me that Parkinson's can have dementia. Absolutely. Yep. Mm -hmm. I was watching uh, your talk at UC Irvine in a video last week, which was fantastic, a lecture that people can look up on YouTube. Um, and you had an interview with Glenn Campbell, who was such a brilliant artist. And at the end of his life, he still went on tour. He, you talked over yeah. here, he talked it over with his children who went with him. And um, it was fascinating because you would ask him questions like, where are you? What day is it? And you know, if somebody starts to lose their memory and they don't know who the prime minister of Canada is, that doesn't matter. You, what matters is that they know to put their shoes on before they go out in the snow or that kind of thing. Tell us a little bit about that. Glenn yeah, Campbell. Glenn. Glenn was one. It was gracious for him and his family to really bear their souls in front of people. He performed during that entire tour very, very eloquently. But you're quite right, Marianne. He had difficulty remembering the words of some of the songs he'd been doing for four decades, and yet his his musical memory and his motor memory was preserved such that he could play guitar without a musical score far into the disease process, just showing that different parts of the brain deteriorate at different, uh, different paces, and yet there are preserved function so that, that he could still entertain far into the disease. Well, I, I don't know if you would know this physician, but I guess about a year ago, I did a show called Music in Medicine. I interviewed um, a doctor from Johns Hopkins who's a concert violinist and uses music, I guess, as a metronome to pattern people's movements with Parkinson's status yeah. post CVA fascinating. And the pattern is what's important. And just here as well, cognitive thinking, pattern, structure, schedule, all those things help a person uh, maybe be a little less confused. And that's why I was wondering too, we have about 30 seconds. Um, physical medicine and rehabilitation doctors may play a role in helping people with cognitive decline. Yes. Absolutely. They can, they can develop uh, new patterns, compensatory patterns. If you're impaired in this part of the brain, they can bring other parts of the brain to rescue that and still preserve oh. function. Awesome. Ron, is there a website uh, that you tell our listeners to visit to learn more? Maybe Mayo Clinic? Yeah, uh, mayoclinic.org uh, and Alzheimer's disease will tell you all about our Alzheimer's disease center. The Alzheimer's Association, alz.org, is a very useful source of information. Mayoclinic.org, alzheimer's.org. Dr. Ron Peterson, thank you so much. I've learned so much. I'm sure our listeners are very grateful and will listen and download the podcast multiple times because you have made so many great steps forward and the world is fortunate that you have been so devoted. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Marianne. I appreciate the opportunity to share some thoughts with you. And now for your real champion, I call this segment the Patriotic Piper. Making music with bagpipes dates back thousands of years when the Greeks and Romans used an early form of the instrument and continued for centuries through large parts of Europe, Asia, and North Africa. By the 1500s in Ireland and Scotland, pipes were used in battle in place of a trumpet. Also for entertainment, but as Western classical music developed, the use began to fade because of their limited range and function. There was a notable resurgence during World Wars I and II when large numbers of British military forces, including the Scottish Highland Regiment, were in training, and now used all across Europe and Asia. And since the 1960s, bagpipes have become part of rock, metal, hip-hop, and classical music. In the UK and here in the US, Bagpipes are frequently used during funerals and memorials, especially among fire department, military, and police forces, along with parades. Well, here's the story of a man who's created a new tradition. Bob Waters lives in Kennett Square and is successful in business. 
He's also a master piper. For over 25 years, Bob has played the bagpipes every year on the evening of July 4th, bringing the community of Ocean City together to mark our nation's birthday. From the second floor of his balcony in his Ocean City home, his music floats across the night air while fireworks sparkle in the sky. Hundreds of listeners gather to hear Bob's repertoire of patriotic music. They sing along, they dance along, even some Irish and Scottish stepping, and toddlers wave their little flags. You'll even see a tear in the eyes of those who reminisce about their own days of service or loved ones lost. He performs an entire military set, including the Marine Corps hymn. It starts with America the Beautiful and ends with God Bless America. Other crowd pleasers, Yankee Doodle Dandy and You're a Grand Old Flag. As a child, Bob's Uncle Jack used to babysit. Uncle Jack was a founding member of the Adirondack Pipe Band in 1948. Bob showed an interest, so at the age of eight, he began taking lessons from a Scotsman. Bob committed to practice and played in competitions. He was named a top amateur as a grade one competitor as a teenager. He was a member of the top juvenile band in the Eastern U.S. and also named a North American champion as they performed along the East Coast and in Canada. He loved marching in parades as a teenager, performing at St. Patrick's parties and family gatherings. A family tradition, he often played alongside his brother and cousin. Bob grew up in a family with six children. At the core was tradition and the values of hard work and discipline. He had a job by the age of eight when he helped Knights of Columbus, a service group, then a paper route, then worked in a hoagie shop. Hard work leads to self-reliance, a little stash of your own money, and the feeling of independence. He's promoted the same values in his own children. And as his family grew, he put piping aside for about 20 years. But when he returned to competing in the early 90s, his band was ranked number two in North America. His father, brothers, and uncle all served in the military. And he remembers the times when his dad would walk through the house waving the flag. Bob shares that nothing makes him prouder than playing for men and women in the service. It's his way of giving back. He looks at the flag as a symbol of our freedom and July 4th as a day to remember all those who work to provide it and preserve it. Bob has been so faithful about his annual and very meaningful performance on July 4th, and we thank him for that. Bob loves his country, and we love Bob. We salute you, Bob Waters, your real champion. Thank you for listening this evening and every Saturday at 5 o'clock on Talk Radio 1210 WPHT. Listen to the show again or any of our shows on odyssey.com forward slash 1210 WPHT. That's A-U-D-A-C-Y dot com. Send us a story about a champion in your family or community. Write to info at yourradiodoctor.net. Well, Phillies fans, It was quite a heartbreak to hear that Bryce Harper injured his thumb. So next week, I've invited one of the stellar hand surgeons from Rothman Orthopedic Institute. Dr. Moody Kwok will discuss hand injuries and surgeries. Send questions in advance to info at yourradiodoctor.net. It's hot out there. Remember your sunscreen, drink lots of water, and find the shade. And if you missed last week's show... You can listen now on odyssey.com and hear tips to prevent heat illness. This is your radio doctor, Dr. Marianne Ritchie, wishing you a happy, healthy, and safe week with the ones you love. Always here to remind you that your health is your wealth. Thanks for listening to your radio doctor, Dr. Marianne Ritchie, presented exclusively by Independence Blue Cross. To contact Dr. Marianne and to listen to today's show as well as past shows, visit yourradiodoctor.com. This program is paid for by Your Radio Doctor, LLC. All opinions or statements expressed on this program are solely those of Your Radio Doctor and their guests and do not reflect the opinions of WPHT or Odyssey. Today's program has been pre-recorded. Hi, I'm Lisa Thomas-Laurie. If you're on Medicare, I've got great news. Keystone 65 HMO plans from Independence Blue Cross have earned five stars. That's Medicare's highest rating for 2022. Some of these Medicare Advantage plans have no monthly premiums, no deductibles, and no co-pays for primary care visits and some prescription drugs. And all plans include dental, vision, and hearing benefits with no co-pays for routine exams. Medicare's highest rating, Philly's most popular plan. Don't wait. Visit ibxmedicare.com star. 
Every year, Medicare evaluates plans based on a five-star rating system. Keystone 65 offers HMO plans with a Medicare contract. Enrollment 